I couldn't possibly make every mistake on my own self. <laughs> a lot of them I could, and a few of them I am this morning, but not, um, not every single one. So am I able to share screen now? Yes. Okay, then I am going to go ahead and do that. She is going to pop back in. Oh, you do And I want to thank everybody for coming this morning for our final breakfast with the expert of the season. And Nancy, I want to thank you because I know, as you said, you're often on the treadmill for our breakfast with the experts. So, <laughs> so thank me for actually getting dressed. Yeah, so thanks for being here. <laughs> it, somehow it seemed like the thing to do for presenting. And, and actually, Lisa, that's a really great point. Um, how significant our appearance on Zoom is really depends on what our role in the Zoom interaction is. And there are times when you're just absolutely a listener that your appearance doesn't matter diddly squat. Um, and in fact, you can be off camera and have it be just fine. However, then it, it moves up a notch if you're a participant, maybe it's a, a meeting for work or a committee meeting for some um, professional association that you're involved with or your church or whatever it might be. And then you're gonna be part of that Brady Bunch array on the screen. And then it starts to matter a little more and in fact, significantly more. And then there are the situations where you're the MC or the host or the main presenter. And then it really matters an awful lot. And in all of those cases, it's really true that our ability to convey any level of presence, whether it's professional settings or other kinds of community involvement settings, gets so much harder, which instead of when instead of being able to bring our whole self to the party, we've only got a postage stamp um, or worse yet, a full screen of our very own selves. So when I think about optimizing how somebody comes across visually on Zoom. It needs to be a couple of things. It needs to be intentional. That is thought through. How is this really going to appear on screen? Um, and it needs to be relational. Almost always when we're interacting with other people in real life or on Zoom, what we want is to connect to feel like they're connected to us and we're connected with them. And on Zoom, one of the few ways that we have to do that in the visual realm is through creating eye contact. So a lot of the ideas that I'll be sharing with you today are around making it easier or more effective to make that sort of eye contact. Now, number one, I am really glad that it's only us women here today, um, because then I can be a little more targeted with my recommendations. And number two, you guys know that I really trust you and I am really invested in your success on Zoom um, if I am going to start with a picture of myself with no makeup on. Um, but I wanted you to see the difference, not just that, that almost everyone looks just pretty or more appealing with our makeup on, but much, much more than that, think of makeup as the, a way to sort of underscore or bold face or all caps or whatever, your facial expressions. If your eyes are more visible, um, your expressions are going to be more impactful visually. Um, if you have on lipstick, the movement of your mouth as you're saying your words is just going to be so much more visual and oh my gosh, what a difference it makes, don't you think? Um, another thing that's just um, really, really kind of magic besides just putting on your makeup to emphasize your facial features and therefore your expressions and therefore your communication is one of my very, very favorite tricks, which is to try to choose whenever you can garments 
that in some way connect with and emphasize your eye color. In any visual composition, an element that's repeated becomes more noticeable. So when you can repeat something related to your eye color, your eyes will just really, really pop. Now, a super typical thing that most people have in their wardrobe because every must have list that's ever been in a fashion magazine for as long as all of us have been able to read um, has told us that we absolutely must have a wardrobe full of crisp white shirts and white t-shirts. Big, big lie. In the real world and especially on Zoom, bright white is an incredibly just that, bright, bright color. So it pulls all the attention to itself and away from everything else. So do you see how in this slide that white t-shirt almost just jumps out in your face and pulls all the attention to itself and away from the person's face. So really, really watch out for bright white. It, in fact, I really encourage my clients to almost just entirely purge it from their wardrobes. Now, one exception to that is someone with coloring like Lisa's where bright white hair is an element of who she already is. And then the white down here on her body is balanced out by white up here on her head, but she's the only person on this call who could really do well, unless somebody signed on that I haven't seen, um, who could really do even adequately wearing that bright white. So toning it down just a little bit to a palest blue, a palest cream, or in this case, it's a real soft blush color that's closely related to Caucasian skin tones um, is a wonderful way to have something on, um, obviously, but not have it be the dominant visual. And when you start putting colors together in combinations, that bright white almost becomes even more problematic. The guideline here is that in any visual comp composition, thank you, um, our attention is going to go most dominantly to the area of the highest light to dark or bright to dark contrast. So you never want to wear a color combination that has a bigger step of light to dark within it than the difference between the lightest element of you and the darkest element of you. So typically that's going to be lighter skin against darker hair. Um, it might be lighter skin against darker eyes. And um, for people with light hair, they just don't have a whole lot of light to dark contrast. So this combination would just gobble them up. They would literally just almost disappear against that higher contrast combination. Here's that same combo toned down with the blush colored shell that you saw before. And can you see how now that's almost an exact repeat of the darkness of my hair against the lightness of my skin compared to the darkness of the sweater against the lightness of the shell. So now it's in balance and your attention can go back up to my face. The same thing goes for busy print combinations. Busy prints and especially high contrast prints really, really pull attention to themselves and away from you. Now I've heard other wardrobe consultants say that on a Zoom call, oh my gosh, you want to wear something bright and high contrast so you'll stand out from everybody else on the screen. And my take on that is if your shirt is going to stand out against everybody else's clothes and everybody else's image, it's also going to stand out too much against you and undercut your personal presence in the situation. Now, if you have a busy print like this, and for whatever reason, you're dying to wear it that day, um, and now you're going to hop on a Zoom call, okay, I'll, you know, you can have a pass on that one if you put some sort of overlayer over it so that you're getting the color impact of it, but not quite so much oomph of the print. Now, at this point, I will confess that I am the world's worst at selfies. I hate them. I hate doing them. And you can always, almost always tell it by my facial expression. So just 
hold up your thumb and put it over those faces that I'm making. I apologize. Also, great message about if you're going to choose prints in your wardrobe, um, choose ones that are a bunch of colors that you have solid things of to wear them with. This is a repeat of that slide saying, and wear your eye color. And, and in case there are people who have signed on since I did that very first couple of slides, this is like really, really tip number one, is that when you can wear something that repeats or relates to your eye color. It just makes people feel like they're making eye contact with you on screen so much more readily. Now, a thing to be super, super careful of is something called the more effect, um, which Lisa just called, oh, that twilight zone effect. Really small patterns and tiny stripes like these are almost always culprits, but other small patterns can do this as well. When you see them on screen, because of the way the image is pixelated, it causes them to do that thing where it looks like they're wiggling. And if that's annoying in a still shot like this, oh my goodness, it will make you just start raving crazy when you have to look at it in a live shot where the person is moving and their clothes seem to be doing that or the pattern seems to be like creepy crawling all over their chest. So be super careful. And of course, it's so easy to hop on just a couple of minutes early. And, you know, when you open Zoom, you can hit start meeting of your own little meeting and check out your appearance. However, if you're going to do that, um, give yourself time to make a change. I did that this morning um, and realized that the pink color that I'm wearing, which works absolutely fine in real life, um, is really too bright on the screen. Can all of you see how I keep trying to sit closer so you're seeing less of that distracting bright pink? Another thing <clears throat> that again applies in real life but is so important on Zoom um, is a strengthened shoulder line. One of the things that really contributes to both a look of authority and presence um, and also a look of sort of youth and vibrant health is a really strong squared off shoulder line. Um, it implies excellent posture and energy and all of those things. However, not all that many of us have a really great squared off shoulder line. Um, so I sell in my business and mark and really emphasize for every one of my clients, just a soft removable foam shoulder shaper. I try not to call them shoulder pads because the fashion world has like demonized shoulder pads, irrationally so. Um, what is out in fashion terms is those giant extended shoulders that were on the Dynasty TV show back in the 80s. That was a fashion detail designed to make all of the jackets that we owned before look ridiculously dated. And then when it was over to make the jackets that we had bought with those big shoulder pads look ridiculously dated, both of which impacts caused us to go and shop. I wonder why retail would have wanted to do that. What we're talking about is a little shoulder support as a silhouette balancing tool, and it really matters. If you can see me in the little strip down the side of the image, I'm about to just slip one out. I'm, I'm wearing them now, and I hope you haven't been looking at my image on screen and saying, oh my gosh, what's she do with those honking shoulder pads? But can you see how I take it out? It just sort of looks like I let the air out of the tires on that side of my body. And how that little extra lift just squares things off. And in a subtle way, it's another one of those things that points the attention up toward my face and toward my communications. You also just really, really want to avoid clothes and accessories that wear you instead of the other way around. These two people were presenters at a workshop 
um, organized by the Professional Association of Wardrobe Consultants for the membership of that professional organization. And I will tell you that both of them did an absolutely killer job. And in a real world, <clears throat> excuse me, in a real world setting, wearing clothing and accessories that extreme are exactly the kinds of things that make people comment on your outfit and give you an opening to say, oh, I can make you look really great like this too. But in a, a virtual setting, can you see with the gentleman, for instance, that the outfit is so light and bright that it really pulls all your attention away from his deeper face and features. And in the case of the woman, really the same thing is going on, especially every time she moved her head and those earrings started bouncing back and forth. So uh, they were fabulous. They did a, I got some great ideas from them. I loved everything they presented. Um, and I love what they chose for the, for the real world, but I thought for Zoom, it was less effective than it might have been. Um, Aside from what you're wearing, of course, you know that you want to center your face in the middle of the screen um, and you want to sit as close as you reasonably can to your camera so the image is more about you than it is about what's going on in the background. And we'll talk a little bit about background in just a second. Oh my gosh, you want to keep your camera at eye level. And that's not always easy. I have mine jerry-rigged with... with um, DVDs underneath propping up the stand of, of my screen so that, that it is looking at me straight ahead. But geez, there's nothing, <clears throat> there probably is something worse. Um, but there are few things worse than listening to a presenter when the camera is shooting right up their nose. Just not graceful. Um, you want to be aware of backlighting, of course, and the, the less contrast in your personal color pattern, the more you need to be really aware of backlighting um, because it does minimize how people can, can see your face and see your features and get your expressions. Um, I'm set up with two old bedroom lamps. This was a great excuse to buy new lamps for that bedroom too. Uh, but now I have them on my desk, one positioned on either side directly um, diagonally behind my computer so that I'm getting much better lighting on my face. That, by the way, also for those of us of a certain age is a wonderful way to minimize any um, little um, wrinkles or there must be some better term than wrinkles, but I can't think of it right this minute. You want to be really careful about distracting backgrounds the whole time this woman was talking. I just kept watching the hallway, waiting for somebody to walk by or walk around the corner behind her. Um, and then I'm wondering, gosh, what's behind that door? Gee, I wonder what those things are on the bulletin board. Um, so the, the less you can have going on behind you, the better. This also is another great example of earrings that were dancing every time she moved her head. Um, and then customize your background to what your meeting is about, who your audience is. The background you're seeing on the bottom right is the background I'm using right now. I will credit this um, idea to my PWA friend, Nadine Kuba, who uses a wonderful um, wicker folding screen as her background. So you never have to clean your office or worry about what's going on behind you. The mistake that I made when I chose mine was that it's so close to the color of my hair that my hair sort of disappears into it, which isn't my first choice, but it's still a whole lot better than what's behind the screen. Um, when I'm presenting um, classes or workshops in my role as an image and wardrobe consultant, um, I use that other background. Those are scarves, and I happen to sell scarves as part of my business. Um, so that is a constant reminder to the audience. It's a lot going on visually, so of course I have to be very intentional about wearing solid colors um, and being sure that my makeup is in place so I still show up against it. And then my final little set of tips have to do with creating the appearance of making eye contact. 
it is really hard not to look at your screen and the other people. And especially when you're not in a presentation mode, but in an interactive mode, um, you want to look at the person who's talking to you or whose question you're answering, but that doesn't look like you're making eye contact with them when they're seeing it from the other side. So I've come up with three little tricks that really help me keep my eyes focused on the camera. The first one is that I take two of those little sticky arrows that your accountant uses to show you where to sign on your tax returns, those little arrows, and I tape them onto the top of my screen, pointing right at the opening that is my camera. So it helps me remember to focus my attention there, and that is really helpful. A second one, and I use this especially when I'm going to pre be presenting material in a more short format um, where I'm not using a PowerPoint. Um, sometimes I'll use this when I've been asked to introduce a speaker for another event or to report out about something. I, number one, I never do this word for word, but I, I type up sort of guides of what I want to say. I laminate them so they're going to stand up and then I stand them up on my keyboard leaning against my screen just gapped to the left and to the right of my camera. So everything I want to, to be able to have access to if I need to refresh my memory about what I'm supposed to say next is right there, but it doesn't dramatically give the impression that I'm reading, which I don't know about you, but when I watch somebody obviously holding their notes to the side and reading them on a Zoom call, um, it makes me have a stroke or something. And the third one, I love this. Um, and I use it when I've pulled up on my screen the notes that I need to be speaking from. So they're visible to me, but not shared with the audience. Or when um, I'm talking to, I'm seeing my whole audience in that Brady Bunch view on the screen. Because it is just so human nature to want to look at your own image, if you go over to the little film strip version of the other people on the call that you can see when you're sharing your screen, the, there's um, a series of little icons across the top of that bar. And one of them is just a flat line. If you click on that one, it erases everybody else and just shows you yourself. And then you can drag and drop that image so that it is now positioned directly under your camera. That is at the very top of your screen at the center. Um, and then when you fall prey to that just almost insurmountable tendency to want to look at your own sweet face, um, you'll be looking almost at the camera anyway. Um, if you want more information about how to look good on Zoom or in the real world, because pretty soon we're going to be back in the real world, God willing, um, here are some resources that you might want to consider. I blog constantly about every aspect of wardrobe and appearance, um, and that's just on my website, which is just my name. Very clever, I know. Um, NancyNixRice.com under the blog tab. I also have a ton of information in video form on my YouTube channel, which again is just under my name. And then now that I've gotten so happy doing Zoom, I'm also doing what I call virtual style school, which is four 90 minute plus sessions spaced a week apart. So you have time to apply the information from session one before you hear session two that covers the whole gamut of everything that goes into building both a flattering and an efficient and effective wardrobe. So that's what I brought this morning. What questions do you have? And while you're thinking about questions, I'll share one other little quickie um, and that is that if you're going to do a scarf like I did here, you'll notice it's picking up my eye colors. 
And if you're going to do anything about your outfit that could move, oh my gosh, pin it. Because I'll tell you that doing this to get that scarf back in position um, during your Zoom call would have made you stark raving crazy. Also, with typically when I put this outfit together, I wear a different scarf with it. I almost always wear this one. And in real life, it works fine. But can you see how it's an absolute no-no on Zoom because it's going to so overpower the rest of the look. So I went back to my closet this morning and said, okay, what do you have that's got that pink in it and can tone it down a little bit? Other questions or, or comments of things that you've seen. Okay, so somebody is asking if you have brown eyes, what kind of clothing can you do for Zoom calls? You can absolutely, number one, many people with brown eyes also have brown hair, so they get that repetition thing going on automatically, you cheaters. Um, but if that doesn't happen to be you, wearing something that has elements of that brown color in it is every bit as effective as, as the blue and green thing is with blue and green eyes. I just, I love brown eyes. I just think they're wonderful. And I also love the color brown as a wardrobe basic for so many people. We are so brainwashed to think that black is the thing that everybody should wear, that everything goes with black, that black makes you look skinny, that black is sophisticated. Go to my blog and just Google in the, or not why do we say Google every time we mean search? Um, in the search bar of my blog, just type the word brown to see some examples of how oh, such a vast majority of people um, is more flattered in the color brown than in the color black. That's one of my like, um, what do you call it when you jump on a box, at soapbox, thank you. Uh, one of my big soapbox topics is how effective brown can be to flatter so many women way more than black. There have been a couple of people that I know you have worked with that come with a brown wardrobe now and it's like daylight and dark. Oh, it makes so much difference. and. Just as many things, when we say everything goes with black, only everything that goes with black goes with black. But everything that goes with brown goes with brown and everything that goes with camel goes with camel. Oh my gosh, that is, that is like such a soapbox for me. It's one of the biggest things we talk about in style school because when you narrow your wardrobe down to the things that go with you, they automatically go with one another. And one of the things I demonstrate in style school is a particular client that I worked with whose coloring happens to be very brown centric. And we put together a 25 piece starter wardrobe for her. And out of those 25 pieces, we could make 380 different outfits. And it's unbelievable when you know what works on you and plan around that and I, you could have done that with any coordinated 25 piece grouping, frankly, but 380 unflattering outfits for you is not a win. It's got to be the stuff that works on you. Like, oh, wow, I can help you. I can show you 380 different ways to look unattractive. Pay it, me for that. You know, it just doesn't make sense. There, I love your tip about the camera. I don't know how many times I've been in a meeting and apparently people have two screens. So their camera oh. is here and you're talking to their ear because they're so busy paying attention. Actually, I had a slide, I have a slide in that slide deck that I was just using that shows that. Um, and it is so distracting, but the example that I have of it happens to be Wesley Bell, who's the prosecutor in St. Louis County. And I love and respect Wesley Bell so much that it hurts my heart to use him as a glamour don't example. So I took it out for today. But it is crazy because in real life, Wesley is one of the just most compelling, gut-wrenching, oh my God, I love to listen to that guy. But but when you listen to him and the whole, on a Zoom and the whole time he's looking <laughs> over here, it was just like I wanted to reach through and shake him. Yeah. 
also, if you, again, I, I don't mean this as talking badly about people because they're all people that I have enormous respect for. But one of my backlit examples is Mary Elizabeth Grimes, who, who runs um, Miriam School. And again, who has as much presence in real life. I mean, you can walk into a room of 500 people and Mary Elizabeth Grimes stands out like there's light from God above shining down on her. I mean, she's unbelievable. But on Zoom, number one, she's an African-American woman, so she doesn't have a lot of light, dark contrast in her skin, between her skin and her hair and her eyes. The same as a Caucasian blonde might encounter. So backlighting is doubly deadly for her. And then she's backlit so you can't see her, and the setting is her bedroom. Now, for a presentation of a bunch of women, that might be fine, but for a, a mixed gender presentation, what are guys gonna, where is their mind gonna go? It's just like, oh my gosh, yikes. I've Any been in a couple of those as well. And actually, now that you say, as far as examples, I could probably be a, a, an example, definitely shoulder pads or shoulder- Shoulder shapers. Shapers. And did you notice that there were a couple of suggestions for um, wrinkles, fine lines and character lines? Mm-hmm. Oh, and- Speaking of that, there is also a wonderful sneaky Zoom help for that. Have you all discovered the improve my appearance function within Zoom? Mary showed that to me the other day. Because it's under the video settings under, I think it's, it's either under background or filters. And there's a little thing that you click on to improve your appearance and then of all the silly things they give you a sliding scale like how much do you want to improve your appearance oh well not completely just a little what the heck no so you move that little thing all the way over to the right one thing to know about it is that it stays set and that's a good thing except when you hop on to zoom the next time immediately after you set it and you look at yourself and you think, oh, I'm going to do that improve my appearance thing again. And you go to the setting and you go, oh no, I was already improved. Like that was the best it was going to get. That was, that was kind of a disappointing little moment. So, so no, that it, no, it stays <laughs> there, but oh my gosh, that's the greatest. And they also have a brand new or a maybe newer one, maybe Mary doesn't even know this. She probably does because she's ahead of me always, but that's okay. That's why she's my friend. Um, but there's a thing that can put lipstick on you too. And then it actually moves with your lips in with incredibly uh, amazing precision. And it can also can put eyebrows on you and the choices they have. If anybody has eyebrows that line up with that, I want to find them. Um, and they can put a beard or a mustache on you. So if you're of a mood, you can do that. But the lipstick one is really pretty amazing. I need to remember that anytime I get onto a Zoom call. <laughs> yeah, now I'm I'm waiting for the good hair day adjustment. They haven't come up with that. Yeah, yet. little wigs that you can. <laughs> you can put little party hats on if that. <laughs> appeals to you. Um, again, that's all under, um, yeah, Mary said she was dying laughing, playing with the eyebrows. Yeah. And having two sets of eyebrows, like eyebrows are really good because they frame your eyes and they impact your expressions and all of that double. That's one place where more is not better for sure. What else have you guys done that you were super happy with? or not happy with and want to. Oh, another one that I noticed in one of my slides, if you, um, if you're going to choose a necklace, choose a short one, because when you're in close to the screen, if people are seeing a, a chain and they can't see the rest of the necklace, you're, they're all like trying to peer down. It's just so distracting. 
And, and that's exactly what you don't want is anything that pulls attention away from you. Also, earrings are really super helpful. So I almost always use kind of high up on my ears, not bouncing around earrings, but watch what happens. It seems like such a little thing, but watch what happens when I remove them. Do you see how much of the presence and the focus on my face just went away? Who would think, but yeah. it really does make a huge big difference. Um, somebody asked, asked about glasses and the only, the only real thing that I would say about glasses is just to be sure that your lighting is um, offset enough that it's not coming at you straight ahead and, um, and glaring. If the lighting is off to the side, it's much less likely to glare. Now there is a wonderful, wonderful way to, um, to evaluate how different different variations of wardrobe and accessories and hair and all of that play on screen is to watch the late night political talk shows um, and the talking heads and you will just see every variant of terrific down to positively horrible 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 every once in a while I'll um I always want to try to do a screenshot, but it's my TV, so I can't screenshot it. So then I have to run and get my phone and wait till that person is back on camera. But especially really big, bold, bright prints on women when they're in a row across with men in tailored suits. And then here's this woman in this screaming print. Her, no matter how smart she is, no matter what her qualifications are, her credibility just went out the window. She just doesn't look like she belongs at that level of discourse. So I'm a huge fan all the time of solid colors over prints anyway. Not that nobody should ever wear prints. I don't mean that at all, um, but they just somehow don't have quite the gravitas. Adding a print and accessory is a way easier way to get that little zip of fun. But what got me down that little rabbit hole was there's some new kind of glasses and I don't know what they are, but a lot of the people on those talk shows are now wearing these glasses that that under studio lights sort of do this funny whitish bluish kind of reflection and they look like um the white rabbit from um Alice in Wonderland it's just it's so bizarre and I I don't know what they are but don't buy those Yeesh. or if you buy them buy them as a second pair for whatever it is that they're intended to fix and not for when you're going to be on zoom uh, just a couple of great tips about um, eyeglass frame selection in general. Number one is color. If you're, and I know there are people who like want a whole wardrobe of crazy, fun, bright glasses, and that's a trademark, and that's all different thing. But if what you want is just glasses that you're going to wear all day, every day, and you don't want them to take over, uh, number one, keep them to the light side, not in terms of color, that's not what I'm saying right now. Not, not that you might not choose a light color, but I mean light in terms of not, you know, big and over bold and whatever. Um, and then color tone them to something about you. Relating them to your hair color is a really, really effective strategy. Um, relating them to your eye color. And if you don't, if you feel like that might be limiting, I've seen wonderful glasses that have a color color to the inside of the frame. You know, like the frame is from the front, it appears whatever color it appears, but it's sort of like laminated plastic layers and the inside layer is only visible a little bit from certain angles, but you can match that to your eye color or color tone it to your eye color um, and still get some of that same impact. Um, and then size them to the scale of your facial features so they don't look overly tiny or overly bold against your own features. We, we covered that a lot in a lot more depth in style school like we do everything else. If you want to read about that, by the way, that is like so far the best program I have ever created for infusing a whole lot of knowledge about what choices optimize any individual woman. 
um, for like 159 for four weeks or whatever. It's, it's crazy. Um, it's on my website, just type in style school or, or hit the, the classes and workshops tab. And when Julie shares, when, bleh, 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 bleh. maybe when, next time you'll give a speak, a speaking on how to speak on Zoom. <laughs> um, anyway. <laughs> Sorry, I just got it. Yeah. It's early. It's early. When Julie shares the link to the video for today, all of your contact information will be in there as well. And okay, actually, I have I have a resource list. In fact, Julie probably has my resource list um, from from when I did um, whatever one I did most recently for PWA. But it gives you the um, the um, links to the blog and the link to the YouTube channel and some of that stuff. Um, so, if Julie, if you can just handle that, that's great. If you do need it again, shoot me an email and I'll get it to you. That would be terrific. I'm, and I'm she also said more, that she's, so. she's taken your class a couple of times and loves it. Yay. Thanks, Julie. Thank you, Nancy, for doing this so early. I know that it's, it is. <laughs> and I appreciate you being the wrap up for the season as well. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I am, I really appreciate all of you who, um, really granted me grace when I was forced to cancel on Lisa at the very, very last second um, because my brother passed away. And I, so, and I really um, pride myself on being able to power through anything, um, but I could not power through that day. So I appreciate the kindness that everyone extended to me at that point in time, wow. especially Lisa. Because having your speaker cancel at 10 o'clock the night before a 7 a.m. is not fun. And so you're you're the best. And I well, appreciate it. And back at you. Thank you, everybody, for being here. And Julie will be sending the, the link to YouTube. So, Nancy, again, thank you so much. Have a great um, day, everybody. You are so welcome. See ya. <laughs>